Good evening, I'm Otis Brawley, co-editor of the Cancer History Project and Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of uh, Oncology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome to uh, this program in celebration of Black History Month. We have a panel to discuss the evolution of the health equity movement. It's my privilege tonight to introduce to you uh, Dr. Edith Mitchell, Professor of Medicine and Oncology at the Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson Medical Center. Dr. Mitchell is also a retired U.S. Air Force Reserve General. She's also a member of the President's Cancer Panel. Dr. John Stewart is Professor of Surgery at Louisiana State University. He's also Director of the LSU Cancer Center. Dr. Robert Wynn is Professor of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Virginia Commonwealth University. He is also guest editor of the Cancer History Project for this month, and he's director of the Massey Cancer Center. I wanna welcome all of you. I wanna start out with just a little bit of history because it's important to remember where we came from. In the 1960s and early 1970s, there was increasing interest in differences in health status among blacks and whites. This grew naturally out of the civil rights movement. Uh, the 1960s was a time when we still had segregated schools, including segregated medical schools. Yale Medical School, for example, only allowed two blacks per class. Others didn't allow any. There were segregated hospitals for patients and for doctors. Literally, Black doctors were not allowed to practice medicine in many hospitals. Interest in minority health grew, and it became an academic discipline in the 1970s and 80s. The field was uh, catalyzed by uh, Secretary of Health, and it was called Health Education and Welfare at the time, Patricia Roberts Harris. Secretary Harris really stimulated a great deal of work looking at differences in outcome between Blacks and whites. Later on, Margaret Heckler, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Reagan administration would take, the, uh, take this on, and she would literally commission what became known as the Heckler Report. The Heckler Report of 1986 demonstrated a lot of problems, Black versus white, in terms of outcome. Uh, Lewis Sullivan, Dr. Lewis Sullivan at that time was on the National Cancer Advisory Board, and he would stimulate a lot of this as well. He would later help uh, to further stimulate it when he was Secretary of Health and Human Services under then George H. W. Bush, 1988 to 1992. It was at this time that the Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health was formed the NIH Office of Minority Health was also formed in several offices in CDC and HRSA and elsewhere. In the 1980s, outcomes research at the same time was maturing. We're very fortunate that uh, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act in 1972, and this created the SEER program, the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program, which documented cancer incidence and cancer mortality in first nine and later 17 sites across the United States. And this gave us over time data showing differences in incidence, differences in mortality between black versus white. By executive order, Raul Reagan uh, uh, mandated that we start collecting and publishing data for Hispanics, Asians, and Native Americans as well. And this data began being published in 1990 and has been published since. And so there you have the evolution of a discipline, first called minority health, then called special populations research, then later under David Satcher, a surgeon general called health disparities. And today uh, we tend to call it health equity. It is studying the differences in outcome and studying interventions to try to reduce those differences in outcome. And so I thank my distinguished panel. All of you have, tr have contributed tremendously to the discipline of medicine, as well as the discipline of health disparities. I'm going to start out with a question. What was it like as a young Black 
in medicine. What were your challenges and who helped you with those challenges? I'll start with you. Number one, she is a uh, one. Of, she's one of the few uh, doctors who, as an Air Force reservist or military reservist, has ever attained the rank of general. And she is two, a reti now a retired two-star Air Force Reserve general. Number so number one, she deserves the respect. Uh, number two, I, I have known uh, Dr. Edith Mitchell all of my life. And I'm so proud of her. And number three, I'm even more proud because I'm a veteran too. But I didn't get to be a general. So General Mitchell. So thank you so much, Dr. Brawley. Um, Colonel Brawley. Captain, Captain. Cap <laughs> it's an 06 in the Navy. Yes, and that I know, I know. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. And yes, we have known each other and our families connected for many, many years. Thank you for the opportunity to join this great panel tonight. And um, I think there are several things that influenced my growth uh, in medicine. And I always try to keep my ears open to meet with people, to get advice. And I actually had some of the best mentors, uh, both in my work um, as an oncologist and as my um, work in the Air Force. Uh, certainly one of the people who influenced me uh, over many, many years in training was Dr. Philip Shine. Uh, Dr. Shine was um, chair of oncology at Georgetown uh, in my training program. Uh, and he was just a person who you could talk to at any time. You could tell at any time, you could call at any time. And um, he taught me that uh, you don't expect uh, positions you don't expect things to just happen, that you make them happy. You make them happen. And therefore working with patients, uh, working with research uh, was uh, just a part of what we did every day. So it was interesting that when we were ready to take the oncology boards, we were finishing up fellowship and someone in our program ask him in a group session one day if he was going when was he going to give us a an oncology review and he says what he says you've been with me for the last three years you've had your review uh and it was very nice that all of us passed the boards on the first um uh taking so uh having mentors Having people you can trust and communicate with uh, and doing your best at every step of the way. Uh, that has been a model that I've followed. And Dr. Shine was the one who really uh, pushed me. And by the way, I was the second woman to finish that training program and the first African-American. So uh, finding those people who not only can mentor you, but who can open doors for you. Dr. Wynn? Uh, you know, uh, mine is a different story. Um, this is one in which I didn't find medicine, it found me somehow. Uh, that pathway became uh, the story of why I'm committed to this day uh, to pipeline programs and to making sure that I um, give young people the opportunities as I have. The reality is um, my path started um, trying to be essentially the youngest GM uh, for General Motors. Actually, they made money. That's how that happened. That's what I wanted to be. It was, you know, a fortunate set of circumstances of winding up at the University of Notre Dame in which even my freshman counselor at the time, Father McNeil sort of said, well, what do you want to do? I was like, well, no, I'm 
if I can't play football, then I don't want to work for GM. True story. After several renditions of trying to figure out, well, what did that mean? I said, listen, I don't really care. They pay well. Fast forward to a couple of years in, Father Walter, Father Austin, Father Walter has unfortunately subsequently passed, um, but Father Austin is still here, saw something to me that I didn't. And in fact, only probably at Notre Dame could two priests who were in the pre-med program come to me and say, we're going to actually sign you up for pre-med classes and we think you're going to be a better doctor than you would ever make an engineer. And so my story begins. And so the wonderful part about that is that, you know, getting to uh, have uh, mentors or, or no, I would say models like Francis Collins, when he had just discovered the cystic fibrosis gene at Michigan, helped me recognize that I actually may have had a love for science. I just didn't know what it was. But that ultimately with open doors and opportunities, I was able to take that. Why is that important? It's important for me because I actually had never been so enamored with science because when I would go back to my neighborhoods, I didn't see what it did. My whole entire course, once that light bulb went on, was how could I bring what I'm learning from these institutions like Michigan and Notre Dame and all these places and where I wound up doing fellowship at uh, or pulmonary critical care with the Dr. Petty, the Thomas Petty. Uh, the giant in the field of pulmonary and critical care, and also focusing on cancer. Little did I know that as a pulmonologist, I would have the most unusual experience of being like a kitten among a pack of puppies. I had no idea that pulmonologists didn't work as fascinated with cancer as oncologists. It just didn't make any, I mean, we all, from Paul Bunn to many, many others, I thought about, dreamt about, and researched nothing but cancer. So I tell you that story to say that bottom line is that I really think that um, as we are pushing ahead, one of the things you said, Dr. Brawley, that really resonated with me was that there was initial studies of the differences in outcomes because prior to that, we may have assumed things, but once you put the data in place, it actually added clarity. And what I didn't know and didn't know how to articulate, I, I figured in my neighborhood, I really know these things. I went to college and medical school to learn how to put tags on them. And now that I've gone through the process, I've learned how to actually better use data to really frame the questions that I ultimately hope will have impact in communities and reducing the, the cancer burden. So that's a little bit of my story. Great, great. Dr. Stewart, you're talking on the mute. Yes, sorry. So growing up in uh, the Northern part of Louisiana, uh, I think that there were a lot of opportunities that I had um, that were afforded to me by the hard work of my parents, by the support of the neighborhood, um, and by the hard work of many of my relatives. And so um, the thing that was missing, I think, in my journey is that um, I had very few African-American role models in medicine, okay? Um, we had five big factories where I grew up, um, but not really a lot of influence in medicine. And so Fast forward to uh, going to undergraduate at Louisiana Tech and uh, finishing early and uh, going to work in a lab and you know, trying to decide where I was going to go to medical school. And so I received some very good advice um, from Shirley Robeson, who was a worker who worked at um, LSU. And she said, listen, you should go to Howard, right? And so that made all of the difference in the world because I actually was at an institution um, where people looked like me and we emulated excellence. And so when I say emulate excellence, um, LaSalle de LaFall was the chair of surgery there. And so we all wanted to be like LaSalle LaFall. Um, and I think that many of his habits um, still resonate with me today. And so, you know, I'm typically the first one up in the morning because you get ahead of your day, but you also <laughs> solely focused on your patient and you never lose hope in that equation. Um, I had the fortune to, to meet Lucille Adams Campbell and she took me under her wing and I did my first cancer research project with her. And uh, subsequent to that, we did three years of training and went to the National Cancer Institute where I was fortunate to work as immunotherapy fellow with Dr. Steve Rosenberg for the first year and really be under his influence for the subsequent three years. And so during that time, that sparked an interest and in investigation for me, but I also understood the disparities um, in cancer outcome that were so prevalent. Um, fast forward during my time at the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Harold Freeman was there and he actually invited me 
to a um, president's cancer council meeting when he was the chair. And so I think that is those steps along the way that I've seen excellence. I've benefited from the mentorship of people who are legendary in the field of cancer that really helped me to aspire to do what I do today. And so um, a year ago when I had the opportunity to come back to my home state to found a, a cancer center um, in New Orleans, it was an opportunity that I could not pass up. Because as you know, in Louisiana, we have such disparate outcomes in cancer. If you look at um, racial differences, racial and ethnic differences, if you look at rural urban differences in outcomes, if you look at uh, outcomes in the Delta, you know, we've got a real opportunity to affect change. And so not only giving back to my community, but also giving back to the spirit of those who have poured so much in me over my career has been a singular professional honor. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, all of us can tell stories about mentorship. For me, uh, Robert, it was the Jesuit priests uh, in Detroit in high school. And then in, at the University of Chicago in college, it was an infectious disease doc named Elliot Keefe. And then uh, once I went to medical school, it was John Altman. And when you, and John Stewart, when you talk about not having any black faces, uh, I can identify that. I remember when I started at the University of Chicago in 1981, they had one black full professor in the medical school. It happened to be Jim Bowman, who is now famous as Valerie Jarrett's father. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, he was the only black full professor in the medical school at the University of Chicago in the early 1980s. Now, let's move on and, and uh, how did you decide to do what you do? And tell me a little bit about how it's woven into paying back to the black community, the minority community, because each of you does something very special uh, in terms of minority health or health disparities, health equity but each of you does something very different in terms of medical oncology. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, how did you become a GI medical oncologist? And tell us a little about the work you've done even beyond GI medical oncology and health disparity. Certainly, so I'll, I'll weave it all together. Um, my great grandparents were in their eighties and um, reaching a stage where they were uh, not doing uh, as well as they had previously. And my father uh, worked out some details with his grandparents and um, bought part of their farm, which actually was given to my great grandfather from his mother who was a slave. Um, so I grew up near my great grandparents and they were my babysitters while my parents worked and my older uh, four siblings uh, went to school. So he became ill and a, um, I heard the uh, family and others talking about, they could not take him to the hospital because they didn't take care of black patients well at that hospital and they were making a list of who was going to um, be with him. Um, and a black physician um, came to the house for a um, house visit, a home visit. I was three years old. And when the doctor left, uh, I said to my great grandfather, Pa, when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor and I'll make sure you get good health care. Obviously, I didn't recognize time, but he encouraged me to become a doctor. So literally, we did not have kindergarten in our area, but I went to first grade and told the teacher, I'm going to school to be a doctor. <laughs> and that's what I stuck with. Um, I spent some time at St. Jude uh, in the summer after my sophomore year in um, high school. And that really interested me in oncology. St. Jude at that time was one building. 
uh, and as I proceeded through my um, career in education, uh, it was GI that I was very interested in, and that encouraged me to seek a fellowship uh, with Dr. Shine. So that's how I became interested in GI. Uh, he was a noted GI, or still is a noted GI physician, as well as researcher, and he did his own endoscopies. So um, I uh, became interested in GI research, both in the laboratory with him, as well as um, a clinical uh, oncologist. And uh, for disparities, I have been on the path to getting my great grandfather that good care uh, that he needed uh, from when I was three years old. So I've been working on this most of my life, Otis. Dr. Wen? I don't think I even had a choice in the matter. Um, bottom line is when I wanted to go on that, leaving Michigan Medical School, I happened to go to a program in Chicago, Rush Presbyterian. There was a gentleman there, doctor named Roger Bohm, incredibly famous for um, what he did as a pulmonologist and critical care specialist, but also his attention to cancer. Turns out that Roger Bone, Dr. Bone, and uh, Dr. Tom Petty had known one another. And um, I think it was right the year before I became a chief resident, had actually made a decision for me <laughs> that, that I was on the path to becoming a pulmonologist. The interesting part about the cancer thing is that I think that even since my residency, the issues of what we were doing with cancer and disparities between blacks and whites in particular around lung cancer was really stark. <clears throat> so for me, as I wound up going to the University of Colorado National Jewish, um, there was this really amazing opportunity to be around people like York Miller, Paul Bunn, and many, many others who were just focused on lung cancer. So it was easy to actually get in the lab with people like Ray Nemanoff and others. And I found my way around the basic science, basic translational science, uh, the sciences, and was able to weave that um, really into a career in which I've been focused on lung cancer. The interesting thing is that when the health disparities, people say, well, how did you evolve in the health disparities? Well, that, that happened from when I was 10 years old. It was part of the last group of folks that were forced busing. It was clear to me that the reality is that I wasn't just going to school for me to become a doctor, but I was not just going to school for me just to graduate, but I was going to school for me to have a purpose. At least my grandfather would say so. And the purpose was to come back and help out my community. I mean, that I heard from the time I left Notre Dame till even today from my grandmother. So for me, this path of being a doc that's focused on lung cancer, I think was in part set up by the places I had seen some of the most people I was most impressed by, but the focus on the health disparities and the focus on trying to reduce that gap was by John and Hannah Darton, my grandparents, who ultimately told me that don't go to school and start learning all the books and then become stupid enough not to know that you need to go back to your community and help. So I, that lesson stuck with me. <laughs> Dr. Stewart. Right. And so again, I, you know, Drs. Mitchell and Wen gave great examples of why it's important for us to give back to the community. And the, and the message is clear, right? It is something that you were born with, but it is also shaped by the fact that we recognize what's going on around us, okay? And so again, recognizing, at least for me, the opportunity to improve care. The second opportunity is for us to understand why we have disparate participation in clinical trials is what really drives what I do today. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, I spent four years at the NCI and you, know, you generally don't go to the NCI, as you know, Dr. Brawley, for standard of care, right? You go for participation in clinical trials. Um, one thing that I did note early is that, you know, in the, irrespective of what happened with the 1993 NIH Revitalization Act, is that we had differences in participation in, in, in uh, oncology trials. And so as a surgical oncologist, I asked the question, I believe the year was 2005, uh, what, what, does, what does participation in surgical oncology trials look like? And, um, you know, and found that we still have those differences. And those differences is probably more stark based on um, 
a number of different factors, right? And these different factors include things like um, implicit bias, right? Multi-level interventions um, based upon improving implicit bias, multi-level interventions based upon understanding some of the structural barriers to care are even more evident in surgery. So that's really what has driven me. And, and you know, I still live to this day to think that A, you have to help the community. B, you have to ask the right question, but that right question needs to be informed by the community so that your findings are, uh, are relevant to their everyday lives. Yeah, yeah. you brought up the NIH revitalization of 93, which for the audience uh, is a legislation that uh, I have worried about a lot publicly because it says that uh, when we design a phase three clinical trial, we have to look at the result of that trial to see if the result is the same in blacks as it is in whites, as it is in Asians, it, uh, or, or Native Americans or Hispanics, as if those define biology. Uh, don't you think, uh, this is a question for all three of you, don't you think the bigger problem right now, the bigger problem right now is that blacks, especially, and, and, and let's bring Harold Freeman in here, poor people, don't get the treatment. Not that the treatment doesn't work if they got it, but that they're not getting the treatment. Which to me is like, what is Dick Wernicke's example of actually calling disparities? That is the definition, where if everyone had access to the therapy and appropriate therapies, there would be no differences in their outcome. That to me is the inherent disparities. You know, we're still looking right now that black men having a 6% higher incidence of cancer than, than their Caucasian counterparts and almost a 20% higher death rate. We're looking at African-American women and seeing that this is surprising, that there is what I, I believe that off the top of my head, it's an 8% lower incidence in cancer and a 12% higher death rate than oh, I do that, but, but and, and the reality is, I think that where we go often is in the biology, as opposed to thinking that African Americans are just more predisposed by their biology to having cancer, as opposed to the structures that have created many of those disparities. And so we can't talk about the treatment and the biological differences without understanding the structural issues, as I've been going around talking about the ZNA or the xenome, right, the zip code <laughs> of association, and how that ZNA actually impacts the DNA and your ultimate biology. I think we're at a much more sophisticated level of understanding these disparities than we were, say, 30 years ago. What's your line? Um, your zip I'd code like may be more add... important than your genetic code? ZNA is definitely 80% of what's going on more than to the 20% of the kind of contributor of the DNA. I'm, I'm sorry, Edith, but, I stopped but, Yes, but there's also the genetics uh, that we inherit, but there is the effect of the environment on the gene milieu. And that's something that really has not uh, come out in our clinical trials um, and therefore we need to do more genomics on these clinical trials so that everybody has access. But there are influences from the time you're born until there is the development of cancer that can impact the gene environment. There is also, after the 1993 Cancer Act, one thing that we have um, kind of initiated and adopted, and that is the word implicit bias. There's no such thing as implicit bias. If somebody can look at you and based on your color or your gender or some other aspect, that's not implicit, that's racism. If you can see a person and make a decision regarding their care, regarding whether they might be participate in a clinical trial, even with the time spent with them, it is well recognized that Black patients in a um, majority situation 
receive fewer minutes during a clinical consultation than the white patient. That's not implicit. That is a person making a decision based on uh, other attributes of the uh, patient's physique, the color, um, maybe even what they're wearing, uh, how they speak, and other uh, facets that are related to the individual patient. So we need to make sure that we are getting our Black patients into the appropriate clinical trials. We need to uh, revise the healthcare system so that those differences are not allowed in the practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, I am in favor of minorities going into clinical trials because I've got studies, Dick Wernicke did some of them, Bob, yep. Robert, that show that doctors who participate in clinical trials take better care of their patients, of all of their patients, compared to doctors who don't. If a doctor puts two or three percent of his or her patients on clinical trials, they provide mm -hmm. better care. And the reason I've been really into this, let's talk about clinical trials, but let's also talk about adequate care. Right. The studies have been done. We've got six states in the United States where black and white women have the same death rate for breast cancer. And I'll flip it around. We got 12 states in the United States where white women have a higher death rate from breast cancer than black women in Massachusetts. This goes back to what John was saying though, if you actually can have all of the teams and the pieces to put together a clinical trial, by definition, that means you have an organ, an institutional organizational capabilities that would allow you not only to put together those trials that will take care of better, uh, take care of your patients, but I was gonna turn this over to John because I know John yeah. wants to jump in. Yeah, yeah. go so, ahead, brother yeah. John. So, so let's think about what the definition of disparities really is, okay? So we understand it's access or lack of access to really good care, but the double-edged sword of that is that it is also exposure to less effective care, okay? So more ineffective care, less effective care. That's the double-edged sword of, of disparities that we are facing. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to address both of those issues if we're really going to understand health equity and how we move forward with health equity. Let's see the second part of this is that Dr. Mitchell made a very important point. Um, and, you know, we've now got the field of, of, of uh, emerging field of uh, social epigenomics. And, you know, to be honest, you know, it's not something I thought about until I started working with Rob Wynn in Chicago. And so we know that based upon environmental exposures, you have... G you have imprinting of the genome, right? And so that just doesn't affect our cancer incidents, right? It also affects our rates of hypertension, right? I mean, you know, you look at studies of black men who have quote unquote made it, but we still have high incidence of hypertension relative to our white counterparts. There's something there to speak about the exposure of not just our environment, but our ancestors' environment and the way that it's infected or the way that it has affected genomic imprinting and epigenomics moving forward. So absolutely. And, you know, for allosteric oncology, where we are evaluating uh, enzymes, hormones based on uh, stress and where one lives uh, with redlining and other uh, methods of uh, disparities. Uh, so we've got to consider that. It's also been weaved into the healthcare system. So when you think about the 1910 Flexner report, after that report, seven medical schools, black medical schools were closed with only Howard and Meharry um, surviving. But in the Flexner report, is also information that Blacks should be trained in medicine as sanitarians. Oh, and their explicit job should be to teach the Black folks how to keep themselves clean and not to allow diseases like tuberculosis um, enter the white community. So it's saving white folks from 
um, disease processes. And can you imagine the four of us only being what? Sanitarians? Yeah. So, you know, Dr. Mitchell. And that set the culture until uh, the Johnson administration, former President Johnson. So during this time from 1910 to the late 60s, most majority medical schools did not admit many black doctors or black medical students. So the number of black practicing clinicians in this country decreased significantly after 1910 and did not begin to rise again until the 1967 uh, Great Society of former President Johnson. So, you know, so 1910 uh, Flexner Report set the culture for medical school education in this country, and it disallowed the um, education of Black individuals in medicine and opportunities to uh, become clinicians. I, I should point out that Flexner was a noted segregationist from the University of Louisville who was asked to study medical education in the United States. And the end result was, as Dr. Mitchell said, most of the Black medical schools got shut down. John? Yeah, so I, I think the Flexner report is informative, right? Because I mean, he was a eugenicist. I mean, let's let's just be simple about it, right? I mean, he he was a strong proponent of eugenics, and so you know, Dr. Mitchell makes the point of saying, "Hey, yeah, African Americans should be trained to work on African Americans, but more importantly, they wanted to keep the diseases that they thought were associated with us from spreading into the white populations." And so. It, so yeah, all of that's important, but in the rearview mirror, we have to understand, we have to understand who's telling our story, right? We have to understand who's telling the history. Uh, and if we would allow somebody like Flexner to report the history and take down seven black medical schools at the time, we've got to just be careful of that, right? We've got that, whole, that whole soft science, this is why I am, uh, you know, we are at a crossroads right now where we have many people who, um, I, listen, I, I don't think that there's a problem that all of us on this Zoom know that we will continue to make amazing strides in science, we'll make amazing strides with scientific miracle drugs and with technologies. What I fear most is that we will lose public trust. I will tell you that running throughout this whole conversation, was the soft science of eugenics. It's the same science that allowed Flexner to do what he did, but fast forward from 1910 to 1934, it's the same science that allowed a guy like Homer Hoyt to come up with the Fair Housing Act or the Federal Housing Act of the 1930s, which established redlining based on the soft science of eugenics that white people would be smarter and therefore more able to pay back a loan than someone who was black. And so what I, and it's interesting that in an age of TikTok and all this other stuff, that people are not putting the pieces together that science does matter, whether you wanna do it or not. COVID and cancer doesn't really care. And the science of what we're trying to get out to the public, I think is, a, is, is something that I think particularly as African-Americans, we are having to take up, the, the, take up that challenge of how do we better communicate these things within the 21st century. Many people may actually be available to some access to these things, but if they don't know it's accessible and don't know what it's for, and it's not just African-Americans, then more and more people with, 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 again, the miracle cure or the miracle vaccine, or the mRNA vaccine of COVID, COVID-19 vaccine, refuse to take it because why? Because again, the communication has been challenged with a lot more clutter with mistrust and distrust. So I think one of the other challenges we have as not only people of color, but people who are thinking about rural areas and all the rest of the stuff is, how do we maintain the move forward of our love for science and the progress that that science needs to make 
But how are we actually going to pragmatically actually break down that science so that we really do have impact within our communities? And just so like in the 30s, you know, just like in the 30s, the eugenic movement <laughs> puts everything from Flexner to Homer Hoyt, who came up with the redlining programs. We have, again, misinformation that's actually coming out there that will, if we're not careful, undermine the progress that we're making in our science even today. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's so important that we um, look at history and how despite uh, being recommended as sanitarians in the Flexner Report, uh, we have survived. We have worked together with others and I think it's so important. And important to recognize the fact that I tell everybody the Tuskegee Airmen integrated America and made opportunities for all of us. So when you think about uh, the fact when funds to um, from the Congress to uh, build Tuskegee, um, the same thing as sanitarians. It is in the fed federal register, I'm told, I've never looked it up myself, uh, that there was a congressman who stood in the Capitol when there were discussions of funding the Tuskegee Airmen, that it was said, give those in words the money and show them that they can't fly planes. Uh, and we all know the history of Tuskegee Airmen. And then later that um, former President Truman who I think was one of the greatest presidents, don't, don't put that against me. But what he said was he was going to introduce the bill into Congress to uh, desegregate the military based on the record of the Tuskegee Airmen. And another Senator from South Carolina said he would never let it out of uh, table and that this was not an issue and he would not let it go to the congressional floor. And what happened was uh, former President Truman said, I won't say what he, they mm -hmm. say he said, but he then wrote uh, the uh, bill 9981 mm -hmm. that integrated the services. And that was, that was a uh, presidential uh, order 9981. So Congress had nothing to do with it. And yeah. later, uh, the uh, uh, State Department was integrated after the military services were integrated. And now everything is integrated such that we had the opportunities not to become sanitarians based on Flexner Report and to go to really good uh, schools and to get training in those really good schools. So it's how we've uh, collaborated with all of the efforts that despite those uh, setbacks, uh, we've survived. And not only have we survived, but we're in a situation where we are leading the effort to yeah. end disparities in multiple uh, healthcare settings multiple disease processes. Well, I would actually make the argument that uh, uh, the military, especially since the Civil War, has always led the country a little bit in some of these issues. Uh, you know, it was uh, the black soldiers of the Civil War who fought- Absolutely. Uh, and then uh, the, going even into the Veterans Administration in the last 30, 40 years. You know, uh, much of my career has been writing papers on how equal treatment yields equal outcome and there is not equal treatment. And where we have frequently gone to look at that and, and show that is in the Veterans Administration. You know, black men who have stage two prostate cancer treated in the VA have the same outcome as white men with stage two. But in the United States as a whole, black men 
with stage two are one and a half times more likely to die from prostate cancer. And so, you know, we use those to make, you know, but the military has been very good. I'll even say having run a large organization, I was chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society for 12 years. Uh, a, as a black man, I was more accepted as a leader because Colin Powell did it 30 years before me. Uh, and I can give a number of examples of where black people were leaders in the military before they, we were allowed to be leaders in, in the, uh, I was gonna say in the real world, but outside the military. <laughs> The civilian world. Sure, the civilian and... world. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Gotcha, man. Yeah, uh, the surgeons always got to clean up for us. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Otis, um, General Davis. Oh, yes. And you know, with the Tuskegee Airmen, when there was the planned raid over Ger uh, Germany, uh, the general in charge. Uh, as they were planning, ask, well, why, where are the red tails in this? And they had not included the red tails. And he said, leave, don't come back until you come back with a plan that includes the red tails. Yeah. So when General Davis uh, briefed his men about where they were flying to, he said, usually we get orders to go places. But this time we're going by request. <laughs> and when he finished, when the raid was over, General Davis had painted on the front of his plane, what? By request. <laughs> so um, the generals in the um, military, certainly General Powell, uh, but General B.O. Davis, I think was one of those also. And I have a picture in my office of his plane with by request painted on the on the nose. Yeah, and his son, of course, went on to become a very distinguished general as well. Uh, but, but, you know, one thing, I want to pick up on that though and say, if we actually maintain that same spirit of understanding that when called to the to the task that we've had multiple opportunities throughout history in which African-Americans rose to the occasion and exceeded it. Yeah. If that same by request were done with continuing the programs of getting more minorities into medical school throughout the 70s, and you said post-67, and we actually maintain that and maintain the steam through the 80s and 90s, but instead, the interesting thing, and again, I'm speaking as an old-er, uh, admissions team when I was at University of Colorado. The numbers have slipped. Yeah. And the focus has actually also slipped. So one of the things that I really love about the story you just talked about, Dr. Mitchell, is that this isn't going to happen just because it's going to happen. It happens because people have the will and they put things in place and in programs that ultimately says, I know you may be uncomfortable with these folks being here, but we're gonna get them here. They're gonna show you what they can do. And I think that there's less of that that has happened over time where we have not had the opportunities, I think, um, to really to shine because the numbers don't lie. They're going, in some cases, I think a few years ago, what we had less African-American medical students than we had in the 70s. Yeah, uh, we got a bunch of questions here. I wanna try to get some of these in. Uh, real quick lightning round because we got about six minutes left. What was the most challenging portion of your medical journey and how did you overcome it? Maybe do you have advice for the next generation? Dr. Stewart. Right. So, um, you know, this allows me to use a quote that I love to use from Dr. Charles R. Drew, R. Drew former chair of the uh, Department of Surgery at Howard. It said, excellence in performance transcends artificial barriers created by men. Go to work every day and be excellent. Now, you know, I can't tell you that every day is gonna be great when you walk in, just by nature of being a human, every day is not gonna be great, but you have to harvest those opportunities to be great. And a lot of times you do, you have to, you have to look past circumstances and understand that you're beginning that day with the end in mind, and that's to be better than you were when the day started. Good idea. Dr. Wynn. 
Um, I think the best advice I have is ultimately, you know, have grace, humility, and know your North Star. The bottom line is once you know your North Star, it doesn't matter what, you know, turmoil or turbulence comes your way, you, you are committed to ultimately your community, uh, your community, uh, the folks around you, and to being the best you can. And uh, again, I would echo what uh, Dr. Stewart just said, that uh, just do you, and you are usually enough. Dr. Mitchell. I would echo the same, be the best that you can be every day. And another that uh, another topic I picked up recently um, from uh, Admiral Madden, who was over the uh, Navy SEALs and who um, were in charge of the um, um, ending the Bin Laden. And what he said to me one day, and he has said it multiple times, it's all over TV and everywhere is that with the Navy SEALs, they were taught some days are not going to be good and you might not feel good about what you've done. But if you make up your bed every morning, when, and that's the first thing that you do, you can always come back home or to wherever you're staying to see that you've done something good every day. So make up your bed first thing in the morning and do good, do your very best every single day. Great. Now we're going to end, we got a few more minutes and we're going to end with one more question from the audience. I'm going to sl slightly modify it. This is somebody who was concerned that patients don't have enough time to talk to doctors and to get information. And I'm going to ask you, do you think that uh, Medicaid especially, which doesn't pay nearly as well as Medicare, which doesn't pay as well as private insurances, actually causes some disparities because it forces us to talk and see patients in a shorter period of time. You want one word to answer that would be yes. <laughs> so, I mean, the truth of the matter is, you know, the program by the ACS and ACS CAN and NTNN just showed that oncologists, when you took a large swath of them, thought that we, 62%, thought that we were doing the worst job of people of color than we were with our white patients and that the outcomes were worse. Part of that is multifactorial, including what you just talked about, but there are many other things that are at play. So I would say that if we look at the Medicaid expansion and what that did from 2013 to 2018, we saw that it um, allowed people who were previously uninsured to become more, to become insured. So for instance, if you look at the black white gap that dropped by about 50%. Um, and so I think that access is something that we really have to work on. Now, what happens when you get through the door and you've got that compressed time? I think that that's really where we have to do our work, right? We have to do our work and understand how we can have those valuable communications with our patients to make sure that they understand all of the options and that they're comfortable with proceeding with whatever treatment plan they decide to pursue. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I know you've got to leave in a second. You want to say something about that? So absolutely. Access to care is very important. And for us, we've got to uh, lead the way to make sure that patients, number one, have access. And with that access, uh, can in the healthcare system uh, get the proper care, the best care, the opportunities for clinical trials, opportunities for genomic information so that we can say our patients, our Black patients are getting access and they're getting the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And if you have one more, if you time for one more, Dr. Mitchell, uh, what is the current role of minority medical schools? So, um, there are now four medical schools that are uh, based on African Americans, but understand there are other medical schools, for example, uh, the school in South Texas that has almost all uh, Hispanic and Latinx students. So I think we've got to think about all minorities now. Um, 
for many years, we only collected information on Blacks. But now we've got to look at all of the processes, all of the access to care, so that everyone in America is a part of the system, has access to the system, has equal care in the system, and therefore we are talking about all of America. So we've got to look at the whole situation and therefore make recommendations that affect everybody. So all socioeconomic, all social determinants of health so that we are providing good care to all individuals of America, despite uh, their socioeconomic status, where they live, um, rural areas and all others. We've got to make sure that we have not only equity in America for medicine and healthcare, but justice. So. Dr. Mitchell had the word of the night. Justice, justice. Yeah, I think that's the appropriate point to leave. I mean, this is really a justice issue. You know, we went from really minority health with the Heckler Report to special populations health to David Satcher actually challenged some congressmen and said, let's call it what it is, health disparities. He literally said that, by the way, that's where the phrase came from. In a conversation with staff, he literally said, I want to see, and I won't say the name of the congressman, say I am against programs to reduce health disparities. That's where the phrase health disparities came from. Then we started talking about health equity. I think uh, Dr. Mitchell is right. We need to talk about justice. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. A wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. Dr. Stewart from Louisiana State University, Dr. Wen from the Virginia Commonwealth University, and Dr. Edith Mitchell, General United States Air Force, retired from uh, the Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson Medical College. And I'm Otis Brawley, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Have a good evening. Thank you.